Okay, so in, in order to uh, start, it's just to remind uh, everyone that obviously there are two things you want to think about when you are investing. Uh, number one is, you know, your strategy or uh, how you pick your stocks, how you pick your ETFs, how you pick your index funds, how you analyze the market. So basically, it's your decision making as to what to buy. So uh, basically, there are two stages in investing, you know, when you buy and when you sell. And it's making sure you don't mix up those two things. You know, your decision to buy and your decision to sell are two completely separate uh, principles and two separate concepts. So while you're thinking of what to buy in terms of stocks and shares, ETFs and index funds or whatever financial instrument, and you, while you're doing your fundamental analysis, it's just deciding on what do you want to buy? So why do you want to buy that company share? Um, uh, when do you want to buy it? You know, is it undervalued or overvalued? Is it in a good industry? Uh, why do you want to track that industry with an ETF? Uh, why do you want to track that country with an index fund or an ETF? So your decision making as to what to buy is completely different from when you've actually bought the stocks and shares or bought the ETF or bought the index fund when to sell it. Uh, obviously the costs, the investing costs, we concentrated a lot on the decision making as to when to buy. But when it comes to selling, again, this is where it's now flexible. So you've now bought the stocks and share, you now own shares in company X, or you now own ETF that is tracking industry X or you have an ETF on index, index fund tracking country X. So now that you've bought it, it's just not a simple question of when do you sell it? Now, there, this is where, you know, there's so many different permutations and so many things. And this is where there's so, so much flexibility. There's no one rule because at the core of it, number one, you're investing in the stock market uh, for a reason. You know, you actually have a financial goal. Either you're investing for retirement, so when you get to retirement, uh, you can start drawing down on your investment and start selling some of them off to enjoy your life. Or you could be investing, you know, to pay off your mortgage. So you, when the time comes, you can liquidate your portfolio and pay off your mortgage. You could be investing for uh, school fees or college funds. So, Obviously, if you have a specific financial goal in mind, then you know when you achieve that financial goal, you might want to then sell. But other than those basic reasons why you want to sell, the other ones obviously depends on what's going on in the market, uh, which is what I want to discuss because uh, like I've always said that, you know, when I am, again, this is me, but again, the, like I said, it's not a general rule. And I can, that's what I love about investing is that there's no one size fits all. You know, it's your money, you make your decision, you can do whatever you like. You know, you don't have to follow any particular rules. Well, my own rule is that once I've bought uh, the financial instrument, so once I've bought it, whether I'd be uh, stocks and shares, ETFs, or index fund. Once I've bought it, obviously I'm looking at the long term, so I'm not in a rush to sell them or panic or do anything rash. So once I've bought it, so let's say I bought it at five pounds per share. So I bought at five pounds per share. This is my buying price. So my own exit strategy, I, I, I try and simplify it for myself. Again, this is not a universal rule. This is just me. So you, you can just modify what you want to do to suit yourself. So once I buy it, either stocks and shares, ETF or index fund, 
so long as it doesn't drop by more than 50%, I'll hold on to it. So if it drops by 50%, I'll sell it. So if I buy it at five pounds per share and it drops to you know, two pounds 50, then I'll sell it. I'll get rid of it. Um, again, I, well, this is again me. I'm not emotional about my trading. I am not emotionally tied to any stock or any ETF or any index fund. You know, it's not my family business. So if I buy shares in Apple, it's not, Apple is not owned by Banjoko, uh, the Banjoko family. You know, if I buy uh, Tesco shares or Sainsbury shares or HSBC shares, you know, they're not owned by my family. So I have no emotional ties to any of these companies. It's strictly to make money. And if I'm losing 50%, I sell it, period. That's me. So if I buy a stock and it drops 50%, that's it. I'm going to sell it. And, you know, again, before I invest, I am aware about the risk. I know there's no guarantee in investing. Uh, there's no guarantee that I'm going to make money. There's also a possibility I could lose money. So before I invest, I've already accepted the fact that I am happy to lose up to 50% of my investment. And if I lose 50% at that point, I'm going to sell it. If I don't lose 50%, so if it's down 10%, 20%, 30%, I don't worry. I'll leave it alone because again, it's a long-term investment and we'll see what happens. So that's number one. Uh, number two, if it goes up by 50%, you know, so basically if I, I bought it by five, five and it goes up by 50%, so it's now what seven pound 50. At that time, I would then place a stop loss at where I bought it at five pounds. Okay. Funny enough, let me just put this where I do I do a 50 50 50. <laughs> That's what I basically do 50 50 50. Or again, it's not I can modify it. Again, this is not a hard and fast rule. So I bought it at five pounds per share. It's gone up to seven pounds fifty per share, so it's gone up by fifty percent. So at that time, and I'm going to show you now. I'm going to log into my investment account and show you what I mean. So when it gets up, if I if it's gone up by more than fifty percent, I'll move. I'll place a stop loss. If the price drops back down to where I bought it, then I'll sell it. But at least I won't lose any money on that particular investment. Now, if it goes up to 100%, so I've now made 100% profit, then I would now move my stop loss to 50%. So that if it goes 100% and drops down to 50%, then I'm going to uh, sell it and at least realize at least a 50% profit. Of course, if it goes higher than that, so if it goes to 150%, and I'll move my stop loss to 100. So I'll now put a stop loss there of uh, 10 pounds per share. And then, you know, I just keep doing that. Uh, again, like I said, there's a lot of flexibility in all this. Um, you can do what you like. Uh, okay, let me just uh, go to, let me log into my account and just, show you what I mean. Um, it's easy saying it by mouth, <laughs> but let me let me log into my account and show you. Uh, actually, I'm just going to pause the screen while I log in. Uh, just give me a minute. Almost there. Because basically what I'm just saying is that once I've 
but my investment, you know, I'm not worried about what the market is saying. Uh, you know, the, you know all these naysayers in the market. Oh, the market is going to crash. The market is going to do this. The market is going to do that. You know, I don't care because I've already made up my mind how I am going to exit the market. So this is my one of my investment accounts. Um, now we'll just do one or two uh, of what I mean. So for example, now you can see here, this is the cost. This is how much I paid to buy this share. So this is the cost of Ashted Group. I, I, I spent 745 pounds to buy 44 units or 44 shares in this company. So obviously if I want to work out how much I paid for each share, it would just be a question of 44 divided by 745.21. So that would just be, let me just bring the notepad out. So that's the cost to buy when I initially bought it, 745.21. And I bought uh, 44 units. So that means one unit or one share would be 745.21 is 745.21 uh, divided by 44 units. That would give me the cost of one unit. Let me just bring out the calculator. So that's 745.21 divided by 44. So that's 16.9, that just rounded up 16.94. So that's 16.94. So that means each, when I bought the share, each of them cost 16 pounds 94. Uh, and then that's, when you, you soon see shortly, when you do your stop losses, it's always intense. So that would be, one six nine four pence per share. So obviously, like I said, now this is how much I bought one unit. So to work out fifty percent loss is just one six nine four divided by two. So it's as straightforward as that, really. Um, sorry, let me make this a bit smaller. It's taking up too much space. There we go. Okay. So it would just be one six nine four divided by two. So that's eight four seven pence. So that means if it drops to eight four seven pence, I've lost fifty percent. And then of course, uh, times two is 100% profit. So one, six, nine, four times two, that's three, three, eight, eight. So that's three, three, eight, eight, oops. Three, 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 eight, eight pence would be 100% uh, profit. Uh, and as you can see, it's now currently 3915 pence per share. So you can see it's um, it's gone above, well, you can see that it's 131% profit. So it's gone above 100. So uh, I've actually placed a stop at 100% already, but let me do one now that I haven't placed a stop. And we'll do that together and go through the process together. So uh, oh, actually, we'll start with uh, MetLife. Let's start with MetLife. So for example, here you can see MetLife has gone up by 61%. So like I said, once it's gone above 50% profit, uh, I don't want to be risking anything anymore. So I can now place a stop loss that 
if it gets down to my opening price, then uh, I will sell. I did not lose any money on this particular investment in MetLife. So you can see MetLife, uh, I bought it at 99544. For, uh, so let's do it together again. Let me, well, let's drag it up a bit. Where's it? Where's MetLife? Okay, there it is. Okay. So you can see MetLife. Uh, the cost was 995.44. Uh, that's the cost. Well, total cost. So nine nine, and then bought for four, sorry, for one units. So that's MetLife. I bought for one units with a total cost of nine 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 five point four four. So that means one unit will be nine nine five point four four divided by forty one. So bring out the calculator. So that's 995.44, 995.44 divided by 41. It's 24.28. So 24.28. Two four point two eight, uh, and then we'll convert that to pence because this is twenty four pounds twenty eight per share. If I convert that to pence, that'll be two four two eight pence, and I'll just round it up, <laughs> just locking a bit of money there. So two four thirty pence. Okay, so this is the price I bought it. So I'm just going to place a stop loss now that. If something drastic happens to the market and it drops 60%, at least I won't lose any money. And you know, it will, the platform or the broker will automatically sell it at that price uh, and I won't lose any money on this particular investment. So it's 2430. So let's do that. So we'll go to MetLife. I'll click on this green button to place a deal. So let's do that. Uh, okay. Ah. Okay. Um, so I think this one, because it's a US stock, I'll have to call the broker to do it. Um, I have to do it on a, on a UK stock. Yeah, you can see here. Uh, let, me, let me go to a UK stock to show you. But for this one, you, you have to call the broker to place stops on it. Uh, you can't do it online because it's a US stock. Uh, let me go to a UK stock. So let's look for a UK stock. Rio Tinto, let's see Rio Tinto, because that's up 66. Um, okay, so you can see with Rio Tinto, you can place stop losses and limit orders. Um, so let me, let me go back. Let's go back and work it out. So at least with Rio Tinto, because this is listed on the London Stock Exchange. So I can easily place my stop loss on the platform. So let's go back and do that. For Rio Tinto. Okay, so Rio Tinto. So total costs was 74924. 
0.24, about uh, 20 units. So one unit will be 74924 divided by 20. That's my calculator. 749.24 divided by 20. So that's 37.46. 3746. So that would be 3746 pets. Okay, so let's place the stop. So again, you just raise it to your So just click on this uh, green button here to action. Okay, and then this page comes up. So just select stop losses and limit orders. So it's saying, okay, so the Excel just press a stop. Uh, so I select stop loss. Uh, current shares I hold, I want to do for all 20 of them. You can see they put the price in pence, like I said. So it's 3746, 3746. So like I said, if the market drops back down, <coughs> uh, at least I won't lose any money on this stock. Uh, unfortunately, this stop doesn't last forever. The maximum is three months and it expires then, but the platform will send you uh, will send you an email that has expired. So you might need to go and then place it again. Obviously, if the market takes your order before the 90 days, then it will just sell the shares at that price if the market drops at that price. But obviously, if it doesn't and it keeps going up, then you're fine. Okay, so I'll just click, click place stop loss. And so you can see, so you place a stop loss, it expires on the 19th of May. Uh, so if the market gets to that price, 3746, which is the price I bought it, um, it will uh, sort of take me out, so to speak, and prevent me from losing money. So I just returned to the portfolio. And you can obviously view all this on your under your pending orders. So if you go, obviously, if you're using Hagrid's Lanzan account. <laughs> so if you're using Hagrid's Lanzan, you can view it there under your pending orders. You can see I have four pending orders there. So let's select pending orders. So you can see I have those pending orders on some of the shares. So that's the Ashton group where I've placed my stop loss at 100% profit. Uh, Aviva, Aviva, Glencore, and Rio Tinto have moved, I've placed a stop loss so I won't lose any money on those investments. They're all above 60% uh, profit. So again, I'm just saying that this is just something else you should consider and think about just to protect what you've done so that ir irrespective of what happens in the markets, at least you don't get caught out. You know, in either you know you protect yourself from losing more than fifty percent, or if the market, like I've just shown you now, if your investment has gone up 60 70 percent, at least you can protect yourself from ever losing a cent on that investment. Or if it's gone up way over hundred percent, like I showed you with Ashted, you can at least protect your profit of hundred percent, even if the market drops. So that's why I was saying earlier that. Uh, your decision making when you buy uh, an investment is completely different from your decision making when you uh, are about to sell uh, the investment. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so that was the first thing I just wanted to highlight just so that you make sure that you don't end up from making money to losing money, which doesn't make sense. Uh, so, for example, now if you have an investment and you made 150% profit or 120% profit, and then 
some catastrophe happens in the world and we have a market down and the market crashes and you you end up going from 120 percent profit to losing money <laughs> that doesn't make sense uh you know you should be able to at least protect yourself uh from uh going from a winning position to a losing position uh, or losing more than you want to lose in terms of more than 50 percent in my case okay so yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that at the start. Uh, so like I said, this session is uh, for you guys. If you have any questions, comments, issues, um, this is what the session is for. It's not a formal session per se. I'm not here to give a lecture, but just an, an avenue or opportunity for you to ask questions or have anything clarified or any issues you're having or any suggestions you have for us. If you have any uh, investment decisions or or advice for us. Hello, Uso. Hello, how are you? Fine, Hi. thank you. Good, good. Thank you for this session. I have got a few questions. Go ahead, that's what we're here for. <laughs> good, good. The first question I had was, um, I, I've been reading a lot about um, fact sheets about um, some um, ETFs. Okay. And they keep mentioning um, about a hedged or unhedged investment or fund. Yeah. And I, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> I have tried to go and have a look at what it means, but I guess it would be good to just try and get an understanding of what that means in terms of when you're looking at either in whether to invest in an ETF or to carry on with a, you know, buying, I don't know, a fund or, or something. Okay, let's, let's, let's answer that one first. Um, so hedged on hedged, uh, it's really just, okay, let me, let's strip it down to the bare basics. So say, for example, now, um, you want to invest in, uh, let me see how, how, let me make it very simple. Um, okay, so you have a uh, hundred pounds, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, you now want to invest in the stock market. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, if I put my, all my 100 pounds in the stock market, I could lose it all. Yeah? Okay. So you're saying to yourself, okay, let me see if I can put 50 in somewhere whereby it's not too related to the stock market. And you know, you're hoping one of one of them will go up. Obviously, if they both go up, fine. But if one goes up and one goes down, you've you've sort of protected yourself, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So so you can say, okay, let me just go and buy gold for 50, 50 pounds and invest in the stock market in 50 pounds. So if the stock market goes up and gold prices crash, I'm I'm still protected. Yep. Okay. Or if the stock market crashes and gold prices go up and protect it. So you, so that's what I talk about hedging your bets. <laughs> so that's what they, that's the bare basic of what a hedge is. You're just trying to uh, offset your risk yeah. that you're making. Um, obviously, when it comes to the financial market, is more complicated than that. But that's basically what hedging means, is that you just want to protect you. It's a bit like, if I has done a lot with uh, banks when it comes to financial dealing. In fact, uh, me being a Nigerian, uh, it, and of course I was involved a lot in the business and financial world in Nigeria, uh, you find that you know, hedging is, is done a lot because of the currency risk with dollar and naira. You can imagine that. So you find that people in Nigeria who will now uh, take out a loan in dollars from abroad to invest in their business in Nigeria and naira, but they have to pay back the money in dollars. And inflation and devaluation of naira can really wreck your whole business if you don't hedge that foreign exchange risk. Okay. You see what I mean? 
-hmm. as in so you, you do have companies that would you know, that would that you have to pay them where they will say okay don't worry we would take on board that risk for you but you have to pay a fee so they, they will then find a way to balance out that uh, that risk that's why I say when it comes to the financial market is you know it's a more complicated thing but that's the basic thing is that's what the underlying thing with hedging means is that you're just trying to offset the risk and you know make sure you're not losing on all counts. So for example, now, yes, if you don't, if you take out a loan in Nigeria in dollars and, and change it to Naira, you do your business and you don't hedge it, then that means if there's a devaluation in Naira, you're in big trouble, <laughs> you're exposed. <laughs> but then if you were, to, if in that scenario, how would you then hedge it to make sure that you're not exposed? No, that, that's why I gave you the example of you go and buy gold. Uh, so for example, now, maybe the company that is helping you hedge that narrow down, they will, then, they will have to go and find a dollar investment. Uh, okay. So, so the, the comp that's why, so number one, they will charge you a fee for that. So they will now take on that risk, then they will now take on the dollar risk, and then they will then have to go and look for an investment where they can get returns in dollars and get an interest in dollars. So whereby they can then, you know, pay your, uh, your, your interest or your loan back in dollars. So they will take, so even if the, the Naira is devalued, they will take on that risk. Okay. Uh, so that's why I said the actual process of doing it is very complicated, but that's what hedging means. And then like they said, if it's not hedged, that means, okay, you're taking the risk, whatever happens, happens. That's your problem. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I have another question. Yep, go ahead. The other question that I wanted to ask, which might seem very silly, but I, I want to make sure that I've understood it um, clearly. So a while back, in one of the posts that you um, posted on the, on the website was about us, the shares and the companies being in earnings season. Yes. And, um, so then I obviously then started getting interested, more interested in stocks that would um, pay dividend and so on and so forth. Now, when a stock then says that it's in X dividend, obviously then the process of trying to verify who had the stock before the qualifying date so that they can pay the dividends, yes? Yeah. But the bit that I didn't, I got a little bit confused and I think I am, I kind of have a little bit more understanding, but it would be good to check if my understanding is as correct as I think it is, is that when it then becomes ex dividend, when you try and buy the stock, what I've noticed is that the price of the stock is lower. So I'm guessing that they've taken into account whatever dividend that they're going to be paying the shareholders and that affects the price of the stock. Can you still buy the stock? No, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can buy right, the stock. Okay. Yeah, in fact, you, you more or less explained it. Uh, you explained the answer yourself, really. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, because this, this, the stock itself, you know, so long as they haven't halted trading on the stock, you can buy it any time. Okay. So it just a, so like you just correctly explained, it's just a question of whether you're going to get dividend that year or not, depending okay. on what on when you bought it. Okay. Uh, but yes, whether you can you can buy stocks at any time, especially if it's a stock that's listed on the uh, listed publicly on the stock exchange. So if it's listed publicly on the stock exchange, you can buy it at any time. Usually, when people don't want which is completely separate. I mean, what you've just explained is perfect. So with the dividend is a completely separate matter. So with the dividend is just a question of whether you're going to end dividend or not, whether you missed the boat for that year or not. But for buying shares themselves, the only thing that can stop you buying shares in a company is if they've halted trading, as you saw with GameStop and that issue that was going on. So it's unless the securities exchange have halted trading for some reason, um, like we saw in Games, GameStop, or sometimes as you do, we saw during the financial crisis, during the financial crisis when the market was just tanking and falling, they can halt trading just to stop people from overselling. And mm -hmm. so, but other than those sort of rare situations where it's actually 
you know, like a specific company like GameStop where they hold trading for a particular reason or for the whole stock market itself, like you saw during the financial crisis where they would just hold trading. You know, those are the only sort of scenarios where they will actually stop you buying stocks and shares of a publicly listed company. Uh, if a company, in fact, um, what's his name? Elon Musk, <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's done that before. So another way, if you want to stop people buying shares, you just delist it. You, you take your company off the stock exchange. You just delist it. Okay. So once, so it's a, right. once you're, when you're a private company, you can do what you like. You can tell people. Okay. So mm. provided I buy the stock, yeah, so I can still buy it, and provided I then buy it before the next date, of when they're gonna, well, provided I buy it and I'm within the criteria for the next time they pay dividend, then I'll get the dividends that I'm entitled to. Exactly, yeah. Okay, brilliant. And yeah. then- Well, I'll, I'll just add a caveat. So long as you're not buying, uh, the reason why this is a very important caveat, um, mm -hmm. because I, I know not everybody is on uh, Hybris Lansdowne, uh, because if you're buying a, a derivative of the stock, you don't get dividend payment at all. Mm -hmm. So some platforms, one has to be careful. I mean, the vast majority of platforms, if you buy the stock, you buy the stock, you're legally a shareholder, you can go for annual general meetings and all that. Uh, but there's some, this is where derivatives come in. If it's a derivative, with some derivatives where it's not actually the stock, but just the manufactured replica of the stock, <laughs> you might not get dividend payments. Uh, but yeah, if you're with a standard broker and you're buying ordinary shares, then yes, you will get your dividend, yeah. So would a derivative, so would an example of that be, for instance, where there's some ETFs where they don't actually hold the stock, but it's, is it, um, is it, is it e, ETCs? Yeah, so like I said, they're, they're, yeah, so they're, they're, yeah, that's what derivatives are. So they're just, they're just, they're helping you, uh, just giving you a replica, which is what a lot of ETFs do that track uh, industries or countries that are out of their jurisdiction. So for example, if you have an ETF based in the US, that is tracking, say, uh, the Vietnam Stock Exchange. Well, they might not actually have access to those stocks in Vietnam. <laughs> so they will just do a derivative and they will just, they will just try and do something similar to the performance of what you see in Vietnam. Again, that's a very complex calculation. This is where the PhD and economics guys come in to do all this weird complex calculation to make sure <laughs> it's tracked well. But yes, it's a derivative. So you don't actually own those shares in Vietnam, but you, you can sort of get someone who give you something that will sort of mirror the returns of that, what you're getting in Vietnam. Okay. All right, thank you. And please, I'm so sorry, I have one more final question and then I'm going to okay. shut up for the rest No, no, of it. like I said, that's the whole aim of this session. Like I say, it's, 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 a, it's a question and answer session. So if you don't ask, if you don't ask questions, then that defeats the whole purpose of this session. <laughs> okay. So on Monday, you posted about the bond for EcoBank Group. Yes. Which is, um, I think it's 7.14. Was it one, two, five percent or something like that? Yeah. Now, I would, so I know that you don't give advice. <laughs> but it would be quite interesting to get your viewpoint on this particular um, bond, especially the whole thing about the coupon rate and how that works. Okay. Uh, where did I? Oh, no, okay, it was a different setting. Yeah, it was a different setting. I was about to give an example, but yeah. Now, you have to put it in context. So what I've been in, number one, 7.125 is very good. Um, you know, it's a very good return on your investment. Uh, for which, five years. Exactly, and it's guaranteed. Right, okay. So that's very good. Uh, you can't, 
really knock that return. But there are a couple of things you need to bear in mind. Number one uh, is obviously the rating of B minus. So yeah. B, B minus is below investment grade. Yeah. Uh, I mean, EcoBank is a good bank. But then anyway, you still have to be, be wary about that rating of B minus uh, because that's below investment grade. So there's a bit of a risk there. But if, all, if everything goes well, you will get a guaranteed return of 7.125% every year for the next five years. So it's a very good investment. And I think you will find that usually, uh, in my experience with this sort of bonds, um, it was actually... It was actually released on the 16th of February on the London Stock Exchange. I won't be surprised if it sold out already. Because usually I when... I couldn't huh? find it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It sells out straight away. Because right, this, this is very good return. Nobody, you know, this is sort of thing that... Okay, let me put it this way. And this is actually why um, if you're into investing, you need to keep your ear on the ground. Because you find that, you know, I posted this on the 15th of February. Mm. Uh, but this is sort of thing that if you are interested in investing in Euro bonds in Nigeria and all that, you should have your broker. You could, you should already have informed your broker that, look, I'm interested in investing in Euro bonds. So by, and that's what your broker is there for. So what they will do for you is that the minute they get notification from the central bank that this is going to happen, they will put in your interest and try and get some for you. Because usually these things are oversubscribed. They usually oversubscribe by over hundred percent because it's a no brainer. Uh, so usually by the time it's launched on the 16th of February, <clears throat> which was two days ago, it's usually sold out because you already have people who already instructed their brokers even before that date. <laughs> to buy it. <laughs> so it is a good investment, especially if you're based in Nigeria. Because in fact, if you're based in Nigeria, as, you, as we all know with Nigeria and the valuation of Naira, and you know, there's very, and with the valuation of Naira and high inflation, uh, it's, it makes sense to keep your money in dollars in Nigeria. <clears throat> because with inflation, and devaluation of Naira, holding your money in Naira, you just be losing money. Your money is just eroding away rapidly. So most people in Nigeria tend to convert their Naira as soon as possible or try and get dollars as soon as possible and save their money in dollars. Now, if you're saving your money in dollars in Nigeria and you just put it in your domiciliary account, you're not earning any money on it. It's just there doing nothing. So yes, this will be a no brainer for, especially and I obviously foreign investors to mop it up. In fact, the majority of these bonds are bought by foreign investors because they have quick access to foreign exchange to buy this dollar bond. But Nigerians who have dollars in their account sitting there doing nothing, it obviously makes a lot of sense to just go and buy this and at least get 7.7% return on your dollar investment every year guaranteed. But yeah, you have to act quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, there's a question here to show the stop loss for 100%. So I have to log back into my account. Um, let me quickly log back into my account. Uh, but like I said, the, the process, again, like I said, is, I, I'll show you, but the process is the same. Uh, You know, it's just really, it's just the math really. It's just doing the maths. You know, 50% stop loss, 50%, I mean, entry level. It's really just doing the maths. Okay, I'm almost there. Okay, uh, let's try, let me try. Okay, let's try this one. 
We'll try this uh, ETF that's up 165%. So we'll try that ETF. So again, like I said, it's, it's just doing the math. Um, so that's ETF, I bought it at 757. I bought it at 757.51, I bought 17 units. So one unit to be 75751 divided by 17. So one unit is 757.51, 757.51 divided by 17. So one unit is 44. Five six forty four five six is the cost of one unit, so that would be four four five six pence. So that's how much I bought it. I bought one unit at four four five six pence. So hundred percent profit would just be times two. It will be that times two. So that would be, well, I'll just multiply that by two. So that, that would be 89.99. I then we just round up to 90. So that would just be uh, 90 pounds, but that would be 900 pence. Okay. So that's now 100% profit. So that's what I'll just put my stop loss at 9,000. You can see it's now up to 11,816. You can see the 11,816 uh, because it's 165%. But I've worked it out that one unit cost 44 pounds 56 pence, which is 4,456 pence. So that's how much I bought one unit. If I multiply that by two, that gives me 9,000 pence, which is 100% profit. So Let's just, again, just click on the green arrow. And we come to this page with uh, stops and limit. So stop losses and limit. So I'll just select stop losses and limit. And then on the stop losses and limit, it's asking you for what do you want to do? Buy limit, upper limit, well, stop loss. So it's stop loss, number of units, well, all of them, 17. Price in pence, 9,000. And expire after 90 days. So that's it. So it's as straightforward as that. So if the, if the price drops to 9,000 pence, but they automatically sell my shares and I'll just make my 100% profit. And of course it's up 165. So I could even do it higher than 100% profit. But again, that's why I said, you know, you decide what you want to do, how you want to do it, how much you want to, what level. I'm just giving you a guideline, so to speak, uh, but you can play around with it. Because I, I do, you know, I don't, I don't do exactly 50%. I don't do exactly 100%. As you see, you know, I, I can play with it. So that's how you do it, really. So like I said, it's just really the math side of things, knowing how much one unit costs. And then you, from there, you can work out the math for 50% stop loss for your loss. You can know how much you want, when, you, when it's gone up, you want to move it to the opening level where you bought it or lock in 100% like I've done here. So I just click play stop loss. There you go, so all done. So it's there till the 19th of May. And then if between now and the 19th of May, the market drops and it hits the stop level, the, the Hagrid Lazda will automatically sell my shares for my 100% profit. Obviously, if it doesn't drop to that level and the market keeps going up or it never gets to that level and it's keep going up, then 
this would expire on the 19th of May and they will send me an email uh, I'm have to come back again and replace this uh, uh, place this stop loss again. Okay. All right. Oh, and again, don't forget, that's another beauty about uh, a brokerage firm. Uh, because again, yes, this, this platform is here to help you and so you can do things yourself, but the broker is also there to help you. So if you have any issues placing your stop losses, you can just call them to do it for you. Uh, just tell them, look, I want you to place, place a 50% stop loss on this stock for me. Uh, what, so again, they're there for you. It's just like I told you with the American stocks, you can say I, I'm not able to do that, place stops on them on the platform. So for that one, I'm out to go and uh, contact the broker to do that. And of course, you could do it manually. So manually, if you just want, you can, you know. So yeah, you've got lots of options. So options to place a stop loss yourself. Option two is to call the broker to do it for you. And option three, you can just sell manually. So, you know, you can, obviously that one is a bit difficult to do, you know, because again, with this is long-term investment. So you don't want to be monitoring your account all the time. But yeah, you could just notice that, oh, um, I noticed Ashton was up 160% last month and it's now dropped from 160 to 131. You can just say, okay, I'm going to sell it and just click on actions and sell it. So again, there's so much flexibility, basically. Um, and it's you just taking advantage of all that flexibility. But the bottom line is you want to protect your investment, especially if you're profitable. Uh, you know, I think that's the bottom line. Uh, you need to decide the two extremes. Uh, in between the two extremes, you can play around. You need to decide how much you're willing to lose on that investment. That's number one crucial thing. Like I said, I personally am willing to lose up to 50% um, for, uh, I'm willing to lose 50% uh, when I, I invest in anything. That's me. It doesn't mean you have to do that. You could say I'm willing to lose 30%. You could say I'm willing to lose 20. You could say I'm willing to lose 60. It's up to you. I'm just saying I, Remy is willing to lose 50%. Uh, and then if uh, once I get to at least a 50% profit, well, at that point, I'm always willing to lose any money on that investment. And then when I get 100%, just fun and games from that point on. So again, like I said, you can play around with these things. Do they charge for putting stop losses? No, the stop loss is free, but obviously when your stop loss is taken, you get charged. Uh, don't forget, um, there's a pro the, the commission fees for transactions, actual transactions, buying and selling. So when your stop loss is taken, i.e. the market, takes you and you, they have to sell your shares, they will charge you for that. But they won't charge you, they don't charge you for actually placing those stops and limit losses. No, they don't charge you for that. Any other questions? Hello, Uzo. Hello, yeah. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you have a oh. question? Um, I was going to raise my hand. I don't know how you knew I had a question. Oh, because so, you're, you're muted yourself. <laughs> um, so again, it would be quite interesting to um, hear your views on on um, Hargreaves Lansdowne having to sell some of their shares. So one of the um, the, the co-founders or is, is selling his shares what are your thoughts and considering that it's a platform that you talk about during your less during your sessions is you again you can't give advice but what would be your thoughts in regards to getting those types of shares well okay that, that's a good question actually because this is why it's important to separate those two things uh, because Hagris Lansdowne is a brokerage firm. Yeah. Are you there, Uzo? Where's she going? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, okay. Here. <laughs> all right. All right. So Hagris Lansdowne is a brokerage firm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
but it's also listed on the stock exchange. Yeah. Where you can buy and sell shares in their company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now they're two separate things. So I am using their brokerage firm services, period. Nothing more, nothing less. I am not, I did not buy shares in their company. Okay. Are you, are you following? Yes. So I'm just using their services. Okay. It's, a bit, it's a bit like Tesco's. So if you're going to buy big beans in Tesco's and buy your pancakes and buy your cereal, you really don't care if what's happening at the board level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, if you're a Tesco shareholder, then yes, you'll be looking into all those things. Okay. So that's why it's, it's important to separate it. So yes. Uh, so when you said that, I didn't know about that because I'm not, I, I did, I never bought shares in their company. I just use their services. So because I don't have shares in their company, I really don't follow what goes on uh, with the board. And again, most importantly, because I know their brokerage services part, which is what I use, mm -hmm. is regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. <laughs> which protects me as as uh, as uh, as a uh, client of their brokerage services, and they're also a member of the financial services compensation scheme, which means you know even if they do something fraudulent, the government will cover at least eighty five thousand pounds of my investment uh, is covered by the government. They'll pay me back. So I'm. In fact, that is actually, those are the points I actually highlighted during my courses, why I use Hargreaves Lansdowne, uh, because they're, they're regulated. Uh, so yeah, it's good that they're, they have a good reputation and they're on the FTSE 100, but that's all, that's bells and whistles. The core is that they're financially, they're regulated. They're part of, so they, they're under the regulatory body. They're not cowboys. And then number two is the, is the fact that they're part of the financial compensation scheme that, you know, which gives me insurance from the government of UK that if Hagrid Lanzan steals my money, the government will cover me up to 85,000 pounds. Obviously, if you lose your money in the stock market, that's your problem. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so that's the part of Hagrid Lansdown I focus on. But yeah, so you're right. If you're a shareholder in the company, that's a totally different matter. So as a shareholder, then yes, the owner cashing in, you might want to, what, you know, why is he cashing in? Uh, but again, he's an old man. Maybe he just wants to enjoy his life. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, but yeah, if, if, if I was a shareholder, you want to find out why he's cashing in. Mm. Uh, it's a bit like uh, Elon Musk, his brother sold his shares in the company recently. So people were wondering why is Elon Musk brother selling the shares? Uh, so, so yes, as a shareholder, yeah, you're right. You want to know, you know, so actually that's why I went to the news when you mentioned it, because I didn't know about that. So if I was a shareholder, yes, you want to read about, you know, why is he doing it? Is he just retiring, he wants to spend time with his family? Let me see if we can find anything quickly here. It's cashing in. He's 74 years old. I let the man enjoy himself now. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, he did the same. Yeah, and the co-founder as well. So yeah. percentage as well. And like I say, it was a long-term financial plan to diversify my assets. And that he... Uh... That was the only bit that stumped me when he started to talk about diversifying his assets. It was a good thing from a personal point of view. Uh, but yes, that can make, so like you see the news saw the shares close down 1%. Mm. Uh, but yeah, people might be nervous what's going on. Uh, but yeah, I'm not a shareholder, so I didn't really care. <laughs> okay. uh, but that's a good point that you raised. And that's why, in fact, that is the reason why you uh, you might not notice, but some of the news things I post on the website is because some of those companies I'm invested in them. Mm. So like Volkswagen, 
uh, I, I have shares in Volkswagen. So, you know, when I see news about Volkswagen, it, it interests me because I'm a shareholder in Volkswagen. <laughs> So, but you're right. So that's why it's good what you're doing. If you're in, but yeah, but it's important to separate two things. So you're just using their platform from their brokerage services doesn't make you a shareholder. So the, so that so that news won't really affect you unless you actually bought shares. Did you buy shares? In I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to finish my fundamental analysis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The whole, after doing this course, I think I've been a bit of a news mad guy. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> because it, like I said, I, that's why I tell people that. If you understand investing or you understand fundamental analysis, news becomes very interesting. Uh, because again, like me now, like I said, because I'm investing in Volkswagen, um, seeing them, I mean, it was a combination of two things. That's why I actually posted those two things today. Because one was seeing the news that China was the only economy showing growth last year during the pandemic. And there was a huge demand for European cars and that, you know, uh, China has overtaken US as Europe's biggest trading partner. So because you have money invested, it makes it more interesting because that's telling you that European companies, European stocks are going to do well because they've got increased demand for their goods and services from China mm. and they're spending money. Uh, which is not surprising why Volkswagen now, which is obviously German, is now exploring flying cars in the market in China. Mm -hmm. So this is more than news to an investor. This is giving you opportunities to, okay, where can I invest? Or for someone like me who's already invested in Volkswagen, that makes, gives me more comfort that I'm invested in a company that is looking ahead taking advantage of opportunities and being innovative. So basically, yes, it's all, you know, news is good in terms of looking for opportunities, where are there are opportunities. And then also if you're already invested, uh, again, just like you brought up with Ecobank. So again, if, if, if one is not, which is actually why financial literacy and knowledge is very key. Because there are always opportunities every day. It's just whether people are seeing it and taking advantage of it. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, please, could you explain short selling stocks in simple language? <laughs> you have to come for the trading course for that. Also, the difference between a beer or bull market trading. Um, I'm going to explain a bit what short selling means, but if you don't understand my simple explanation, I'm going to leave it as that. <laughs> because yeah, if you're trading, if you're a trader, you definitely need to know the meaning of short selling. And that's a huge part of our trading course. You know, I need, when, I, when we do the trading course, we explain to the traders, I, I really teach them about short selling, understanding what short selling is. Um, because yeah, that's what you do as a trader on a daily basis. You're short in the market or going long, going short. Uh, so you definitely need to understand that as a trader. Uh, uh, so, oh, well, the difference between a beer and a bull market. Okay, these are all trading terms. Let me quickly do the beer and bull because that's straightforward. Then I'll come to the short selling. Uh, so, and. Uh, Bear just means the market is falling. That's as simple as that. And bull means the market is going up. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. So when they say the market is bullish, it means the market is going up. When they say the market is bearish, it means the market is going down. Okay, so that's what they say. So bull just means the market is going up. That's why you have the symbol of the bull in front of the New York Stock Exchange in Wall Street in, in, in New York. They have a bull there, just to signify the bullish or the strong US stock market. Uh, so that's what bull means. Bulls just means the market is going up or they're buying. 
and beer just means the market is falling or they're selling. So that's straightforward, really, the beer and bull. Now, with short selling, uh, OS, do you want to unmute yourself, OS? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, I'm going to, I want you to answer the questions. I'm going to try and explain short selling to you. And actually, if you understand short selling, you understand what happened with the game stock. But I want to use you. Uh, sorry, what's your name, OS? I'm just calling you. My name's Tayo. Oh, Tayo, I was wondering. <laughs> OS. <laughs> okay, Tayo. <laughs> OS, okay. Right. So I'm going to be asking you some questions. That's why I wanted you to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. So this is me. So this is me. I own a car. Yeah. My car is currently worth 100 pounds. Yeah, are you? Are yeah, you so I'm here, far? yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's me. I own a car is worth 100 pounds. So this is you, Tayo. Yeah? Yeah. Just, just say T. Now, you, Tayo, are just a car enthusiast. You're a car specialist. You know everything about cars. You know the car market. Yeah. So in your own estimation of speculation, so you're just speculating based on your analysis and knowledge of the car market. You're speculating. Speculating. So you're speculating that the value of my car is going to fall in the next week to $80. Is that right, uh, Tayo? Yeah. But as you can see, that's just, you just, you just speculate. That's not a guarantee. Yeah. You're, just, you're just speculating that based on your knowledge of the car market, it's going to fall. Okay. Yeah. Are, you with, are you with me so far? Yes, I'm with you, yeah. Okay, so I'm going on holiday for a week. Sorry, not for a week, a month. So I'm going away for a month. I'm going away for four weeks. So I give you my car. So I give you my car and I say, look, Tayo, you can do whatever you like with my car. Do whatever you like. It's, it's yours to do whatever you like while I'm away. But when I get back in four weeks, you need to give me my car back. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Who owns the car? And um, you own the car. Good. So you're so, so far so good. That's why I want you to, I want you to follow this. So I've given you the car. But it's not your own, is it? Yeah. Good. So the first thing you do is sell it. Okay. You sell it, you sell it for hundred dollars once I've gone. That's the first thing you do. You sell it for hundred pounds. So you okay. now have a cash of hundred pounds, but no car because you've sold it. Yeah. So is that cash yours? Um. Well, it belongs to me, but because I sold the car, but the car belongs to you. But you have to give my car back. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> so does that cash really belong to you? No, it doesn't belong to me. OK, good. So far, so good. Yeah. Now, if your speculation is correct and the price drops to $80, like you suspected it will, you can now go back and buy the car for $80. So, uh, okay. So you now have the car and what? And cash as well. How much? 180. No. No, no, no. 80. You sold oh, the car, you sold the car for 100 pounds. Yeah. The price the dropped. to 80. Yeah. And you went to buy it back for 80. Yeah. So you've got 80. No, you've got 20 pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. My maths is not good. It's okay. <laughs> you're like <Yeah>. me. <laughs> but you're following me so far. Because yes, I am, yeah. you, you sold the car for 100 pounds, so you had 100 pounds cash. Yeah. Yeah. And when it dropped down to 80, you went to buy the car back for 80 pounds with this 100 pounds cash. So if you bought it for 800, if you bought it back for 80 pounds, you only have, you now have a car 
plus 20 pounds. Yeah. 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 So, you, so you've made a profit of 20 pounds with the car yeah. with, the, with the value falling. Yes. So you can give me my car back and you keep your 20 pounds. So yeah. you make, so you, 20 so you, pounds profit. profit. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if it drops to 60 pounds, you've made more money. Yeah. So the more the value drops, the more money you make. Okay. So this is what you get with short selling stocks too. Okay, so but what about if, if you then want your car back? No, you, you, that's what, okay, I want to give you the other scenario. Yeah, okay. Because like I said, you have to give me my car back. It's not yours, regardless. Yeah. Now, let's, let's take the other scenario. The, car, the value of the car goes up to 120 pounds. Now, you will have to buy the car back at 120 pounds because you have to give me my car back. But now you only have 100 pounds cash from the sale. You will have to now take out 20 pounds from your pocket and yeah, add it to money. that. Exactly. Okay. If it goes up to 140 pounds, well, you just have to bring out 40 pounds from your pocket and buy it back because I need my car back. Okay. So yes, so you're right. Regardless of what happens, you have to get my, give me my car back. So you're either going to buy it at a cheaper price and make a profit or buy it at a very expensive price and lose money. Okay. So this is what short selling in the market is about. This is, this is so this is what they talk about short selling uh, or selling short or going short. They all use all this funny term, but this is what they mean. So this is what happened with GameStop. Okay. So, so with GameStop, this is actually exactly what happened. So let's, it's a shame I can't use a, oh right, yeah, we've got an eraser here, good. So in the, with GameStop, the, the car now is GameStop. Yeah. Uh, now that I've, uh, see, I'm now struggling with my, oops. Okay, let me just play it and start again. <laughs> Okay. Oh, come on. Ah, okay. I was trying to be smart there, but okay, let's start again. So with GameStop, this is actually what happened. So it's the same thing. The hedge fund managers so that's what GameStop was GS. So the, the GameStop is now the car. Yeah. Yeah. So this hedge fund managers, what they did is that they borrowed GameStop, which is the car. Yeah. Yeah. Believing the value will fall. So they got the car and they, they were speculating that the value of GameStop speculating that the value of GameStop will fall. So they were trying to profit from the value falling. Yeah. 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 So they had already taken out a loan. They had loaned the car. The car is not theirs, which was GameStop. They had bought lots of it, billions of it, hoping that it would drop in price. They'll buy it cheap and make a huge killing. Yeah. Yeah. Then Robin Hood <laughs> traders, <laughs> knowing what they were doing, started to buy the stock and drove the price up. Yeah. So now they drove the price up. That's where those head fund managers started crying like babies because they <laughs> know that they had to buy it back. <laughs> yeah. and, okay. and this is why if you understand, this is why it's good that you ask that because if you understand what happened with the GameStop, it wasn't on, it was nothing new. It's just that it came out into the public and it was a spectacle, but it's something that has been happening for hundreds of years in the market. It's just that people who are not traders were not aware. So, but the Robin Hood traders, they were smart because they now knew that they could just buy this stock. Yeah, it was a yeah. no brainer because you can, buy, you can buy the stock, 
drive up the price because you know these guys have to buy back. <laughs> they have to buy that, that price back from you. Okay, so could this actually happen in the UK? So how would we know if, I, I know obviously we're looking at long-term invested, yeah. but if let's say there's a particular stock on how this lands down, how would we know if these um, hedge fund managers are actually short selling the stock? But you just hit the nail on the head. You have to ask yourself, are you trading or are you investing? All right, okay. Yeah. So if you're a trader, it really doesn't matter because you're doing the same thing. <laughs> if you're an investor, this is actually why your fundamental analysis is important. Okay. Because, for example, now, these guys are not going to short sell Apple shares. They're not going to short sell Amazon shares. They're just going to fail. So they're going to short sell. I mean, the reason why they short sell, they short sold GameStop is because the fundamentals of GameStop is bad. It's a company yeah. going out of business. So that's yeah. a no-brainer. Okay. So it's like the airline industry now. There's a likelihood they're probably shorting some of those airline stocks because the airline industry is, at, is, is on its knees. Yeah. And some of these airline companies are going to go bankrupt. So again, this is why fundamental, and number one, this is why it's important to differentiate trading from investing because the concepts, the mentality, completely different. Yeah. And then, because once you understand you're investing, then investing means you're looking to the long-term and you need to do your proper fundamental analysis. Yeah, yeah. Because if you do your analysis and you know, okay, this is a good, solid company, uh, you know, I'm sure, block, do you remember Blockbusters? Yes, yes, okay. out of um, business now, yeah. Of course, but when they were dying off and Netflix and stream was coming in and they were dying off, of course, that's a good one to short sell. Isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a little prayer. Yeah. And then if you as an investor, we're going to invest in that company, it doesn't make sense. It has no. Yeah. <laughs> so you see what I mean? Yes. Whereby are you trading or are you investing? Yeah. So if you're trading, then yeah, you can short sell. I short sell on a daily basis because I trade on a daily basis. So you, you, what, you take advantage and you, you sell and make your money. But as an investor, when I'm now investing, I'm looking for solid companies that are profitable and I'm looking to invest in them long-term. Okay. But yes, the problem is that when people mix the two, and that's when they get into trouble. Yeah. And then they get caught up in this hedge fund web. So, so for example, now GameStop, it would have made no sense for an investor to have bought GameStop shares for the long term makes no sense. Mm. Because if you do your fundamental analysis and you analyze that company, you know it's dead. Dead, yeah. But if you are a trader, yeah, you could get involved in the fund. <laughs> <laughs> because again, you're not looking at fundamentals. Yes. You're yeah. just looking to be on the right side of that equation of the short sellers and the buyers. <laughs> So that's a different concept. Thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? Actually, um, I don't know if I told you guys, I'm not sure I put it on the platform. Um, let me see if I, okay, I think I have to post it tomorrow on the platform. I'm just gonna send you a link now that you talked about trading. I'm actually doing a free seminar on Saturday, although it's for, it's for a group in Canada, but you're welcome to join if you want to hear a bit more about trading. I think I'll actually post it on the platform tomorrow too. Well, let me just see if I can find the link. Ah, where is it? Ah, found it. Okay, here we are. Okay, so that's the seminar I'm doing on Saturday, this Saturday. Uh, like I said, it's done by the REMA Educational Development Corporation. So it's this Saturday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., but that is Toronto time. 
that's not UK time, that's Toronto time, because this is for the group in uh, Canada. Um, uh, but like I said, I'll, but it's free, but you have to register. Uh, I will just, so you have to register for the meeting. Let me just copy and paste this into the group. Well, I'll post it on the website. I'll post it on the platform tomorrow. Uh, completely forgot about that. Uh, but I'll post it on the platform tomorrow. But that's the link. I've just sent it in the chat box, but I'll post this also on the platform tomorrow for everyone. So any one of you who wants have, if you haven't been on the trading course, obviously for those who've been on the trading course, uh, you don't need to attend this because I'm just gonna be talking very basic stuff. <laughs> so if you've actually been on the course, this will, this will be not, you know, it will be too elementary for you. you. You won't learn anything if you've been on the course from this. But if you've never been on the uh, Forex trading course I, I run, then yeah, you can join that just to um, get an insight into trading. So it's this Saturday, uh, 1 p.m. Toronto time. You need to register. I've just posted the Zoom registration link in the chat box, but I'll also post it on the platform uh, tomorrow morning. Any other questions? Of course, the recording tour of this session will be posted on the platform tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Uh, I would have posted it tonight, but it's 10.30 at night in UK, in, in Rwanda. It's 10.30 at night, and it really takes about 30 to 40 minutes for the recording to be processed. And I'll be in bed by then, so <laughs> I'll post it in the morning. Okay, any questions before I call it an evening? Any more questions? Okay, good. So if there are no more questions, I wish you all a very good evening. Uh, sleep well, uh, keep safe, and we'll catch up on the platform.